I remember asking him, oh, David, I feel a little weird. Did I make this too funky? Classic David Bowie moment. He says, no, nah, darling, is there such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> hard pressed to, f to pick a record I don't know because my whole life revolved around vinyl and my whole life revolved around all different sorts of music. Be it David Crosby, who I actually rode to Live Aid with on the bus and he was telling me stories that had me crying. And Leonard Cohen, I mean, come on, I grew up with Leonard Cohen. I'm an old Black Panther. I'm a total protest music kind of guy. These dudes, when this record came out, I was voted the number one producer in America because I had the number one, the number two, and the number three single all on the charts at the same time. The Beatles had never even uh, achieved that. Great story about this one. So this is the very first time I ever heard a Bowie record. I was in a, a restaurant in Miami Beach the house photographer came over and took a picture of me. I have no idea why she did that. I was uh, very young. I was in a band called New York City, and we were opening for the Jackson 5 for a couple of gigs on their first leg of their American world tour. And she asked me if I wanted to go to the nude beach with her and listen to her favorite album. I said, sure, how could I pass that up? Like, you ask me, like, do you want a million dollars? Sure, of course. And I had never even heard the name David Bowie before. And as soon as she played this, I was mesmerized the whole night. Now, not only because she was gorgeous and I was in Florida, not exactly where black dudes go with white girls on a nude beach, but um, we played this over and over and over and over again. I don't think that people give David, the lyric writing quality, they don't put him in that genius category like uh, Paul Simon and uh, Bob Dylan. He's there, man. When you look at the lyrics on this record, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Became the special man, then we were Ziggy's band. I mean, like just in that moment, because he was playing so well, you know, Ziggy played guitar, jamming good with, you know, and the spiders from Mars, he played it left hand, but he made it too, and that's it, he made it too far, became the special man, then we were Ziggy's man. That's happened to me. Luther Vandross used to be my boss, and then I cut my first Chic song, became the special man, and Luther was in my band. <laughs> because my love for Madonna is probably the single most determined artist I've ever worked with in my life. I've never worked with anyone who's had a clearer vision at such an early point in their career, except maybe me, now that I think of it. <laughs> when she played me her demo, she told me, well, Naya, if you don't like all the songs on this album, we can't work together. And I looked at her and I said, well, Mo, I don't like the, all the songs on these albums, but one thing I can guarantee is by the time I finish with it, I'm gonna love them. <laughs> so I guess she didn't fire me, and it wound up being the single biggest album of my life. She's an amazing artist. I was actually here both nights that they made this record. It was amazing. I got in as a, uh, with fake ID, pretending to be a journalist and it was the most amazing night of my life. It was unreal. This is the kind of record changes your life. You know, it's like you walk in and you were one way before that, and of course you Doug Hendrix, but then all, all of a sudden you see this new configuration. The cool thing was this thing called Machine Gun. And it did take them two nights to get it right. Oh, wow. And Power of Soul. Do, 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 boom, boom. Anything you want to do, 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 Amazing. Amazing. I don't even know how long they rehearsed it, but it was sick. Sick. Someone once told me, artists are the gatekeepers of truth. And when I worked with In Excess on this song, 
the original lyric was dream on white boy white boy dream on white girl white girl and i said well you know guys that's cool i says but you're from australia a lot of racial shit there i'm from america my stepfather is white my mom is black you know it would be so much more powerful and we changed it and we got Hall, Daryl Hall from Hall and Notes to sing on this. And I remember his manager flipped out on us when we changed that lyric. But the band was awesome and loved it and they loved being really frontal about a message. And what was really incredible was that even with all the um, negativity around them from the business side, went number one. <laughs> so their record company. This. This is my whole life. I, there's no section here. I mean, I come from psychedelic rock. That's, that's the beginning of my guitar playing. We, we could hang here all day and I'd be any one of these sections. When, um, uh, this changed the world. Before we heard the fun, fun, fun of the autobahn. Even though we had been exposed to elect electronic music, when Kraftwerk finally hit the scene, it became the foundation of not only electronica, but it was huge with hip hop. I mean, absolutely massive. Their beats, sampling Kraftwerk beats, man, was like, there were a few bands, but I don't think any as influential as Kraftwerk at the time. They were more rock, they didn't have that groove, they didn't have that Once you heard that Kraftwerk groove, man, phew, changed the whole vibe. This is crazy. I know, like every record. This is, oh, come on, man. This, um, so how many times in my life can I think of an album actually causing a seismic shift in your world? Prior to this record, I was just diagnosed with cancer and it was extremely serious. They called me up and says, uh, hey, nah, we wanna come up and play some demos for you. And um, I honestly have no independent memory of them ever playing one demo because they told me the concept. And it was the concept that blew me away. Daft Punk, we're robots. And the more time we spend with humans, the more human our music gets. And prior to doing the Tron soundtrack, we had never done an album with other human beings in the room. And so this had inspired us to take the next step into becoming human after all. They happened to be recording at Hendrix's studio, Electric Ladyland, and I said to them, guys, do you realize that you're standing in the exact same spot where Bernard Edwards was standing when we did Sheik's first single? So we recorded Dance, 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 Yowza, Yowza, Yowza at Electric Lady, and then they asked me, well, how do you make chic records? And I said, well, we block out the harmony and then I play a single note part and then I play my chuck on top of it. I showed them how you do that. You track one guitar part and then you track another one on top of it and that gives you the basis of the hook. And I play do which became get lucky. So this seismic shift in my life. Uh, when, I, when I first met uh, David Bowie, believe it or not, for a guy who's a rock and roll god, we never, ever, ever talked about rock and roll. We only talked about jazz and avant-garde jazz. And, um, and the first thing he brought up to me was, nah, darling, do you ever hear this album by Dolphy called Out to Lunch? I was like, shh, David, you ever hear this album? by Dolphy called 17 West. And he went, yeah. I was like going, damn, David. And next thing you know, we spent the whole night talking about jazz and never once mentioned any rock band, any R&B band. It was all about Eric Dolphy, all about Cecil Taylor. And when he found out that I was an actual arranger of jazz and classical music, um, that's when he decided that I was gonna work with him. It all happened in one meeting. <laughs>
<laughs> and it had nothing to do with rock and roll. With, with David, it's hard to come up with one special moment because any time you spent time with him, he could make a mundane moment special. A great example, when David first played Let's Dance For Me, and, um, and it sounded like a folk song, and I asked him if I could do an arrangement of it. And he was so committed to what he had done that he came to my bedroom in Switzerland and he sang it perfectly. I mean, he just, it's, he, had, he had it memorized. And he was really killing it. And, um, and I said, well, David, do me a favor. Let me do an arrangement and you sing exactly what you sang on that song and let me handle the music. But don't change anything. Sing it exactly the same way. And he couldn't believe that I could take that song and rearrange it so dramatically that it wound up being the sort of funky dance kind of song that it was, coolest guy in the world. Miles had been a friend of my family, so I had known him uh, pretty much since my childhood. We actually became good friends on an Issey Miyake fashion shoot. Uh, Issey made a coat for me that was a one of a kind that he decided not to sell because it was too expensive. It was fake fur, it was a fake seal coat. After that, Miles and I would go out every night and he would say to me, now, nah, do me a favor, man. I want you to write me a motherfucking good times. And I would say, Miles Davis, you want me to write you good times? Yeah, man, and give me that motherfucking coat. Um, I never gave him the coat and I never wrote him a good times because I always thought they were just making fun of me. Every night with Miles was beautiful. And I would write jazz fusion songs and give it to him. And he would go, man, I can write that shit. Marcus can write that. Talking about his bass player, Marcus Miller. Marcus can write that. I want a motherfucking good times. And when I looked at the end of his career and I saw that he was covering Michael Jackson and he was doing sort of more radio friendly tunes, I realized that he wanted what all recording artists, what all artists want. They want to be heard. And the only way that you can really be heard is in the popular market. And, uh, and I felt horrible because I really could have written him a really cool funk song. I could have easily turned one of those jazz fusion songs into something that had a groove and Miles could do his thing on top of it and we might even sing. I would, man, imagine if I could get Miles Davis to sing with that voice. Yeah, man, I won't get down with it, you know, something, you know, just to say, yeah, this is Miles Davis. I'm with, just, you know, shout me out. Miles Davis and Nile Rodgers, man, we're going to throw this down. Boom, ba, doom, ba, doom, ba, doom, ba, boom, ba. Never did it. I'm sorry forever. Hey, hey man. Who are you? <laughs> uh, I'm a guy who made a lot of these things. You a producer? Yeah. Oh, sounds like you've had an amazing life. Thank you. Um, congratulations, bro. <laughs> oh, here you go. Talk about changing my life. So um, I was 14 years old. I was this young black kid uh, going to the skating rink. We saw these kids, these white kids on the other side. They had really long hair. It's like in their faces. And we had never seen dudes like that before. And we, we went over to them because unfortunately I was a glue sniffer. And I went over to these guys and I said, who are you guys? And they said, oh, wow, man, you know, we're freaks, man. We said, freaks? I said, you mean like the movie? We accept them, we accept them, one of us, one of us. Goonie gobble, goonie gobble. And then they started laughing. They went, wow, spade cats. They said, hey, man, you want to take a trip? We said, absolutely. Uh, and they had just had this record. It had just come out just that day. And we went up into the Hollywood Hills. I met this guy named Dr. Timothy Leary. I had no idea who he was. We dropped acid. I didn't come home for two days. And we listened to this song called The End over and over and over again. We played it while watching a cathode ray tube with the picture tube taken out and um, filled with glass hair that you put on a Christmas tree and Christmas lights flickering in it. And it just went, this is the end. Do, 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 beautiful friend, the end. <laughs> Mother, yes, son, I want to kill you. Father, yes, I want to kill. Dead it, dead it, dead it. <laughs> <laughs>
I had been missing for two days. I, I got home, my grandmother had the cops at the house and they were like, what happened to you? My clothes were all tattered. Um, I left home singing R&B songs. I came home singing The Doors, The Trogs, Them, and I became a hippie in two days. Amazing. This, this, this changed my life maybe more than anything. Because prior to this, I never touched a guitar. I picked up the guitar, I learned the Beatles song, A Day in the Life, and the rest is history. Amazing. Amazing. Amazing.